Uh, okay, so I guess I'm the last session before break, so let's power through. So uh, as I said, I'm talking about IoT and autonomous vehicle in the clouds, particularly a use case involving SLAM, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. And I did the implementation with Kafka and Spark Streaming, and this is an open source implementation. Uh, this is PQ, our Totobot. He's an open source uh, robot for research robotics. Um, probably you've seen the Turtlebot before, but I, I brought him so that he could say hello to you all. So a little bit about me. Uh, basically, these are all the schools and jobs I've had before. Uh, like most people, I bounce around a lot. Uh, that's me at the Spark STC in San Francisco, where I work with uh, IBM. Uh, it's a great office. Please stop by if you're in California, if you want to leave this blizzard. So. What we're dealing with now is uh, we have robotics today. We have robotics competitions that are going on. Uh, we have the KAIST team where they had a robot that actually drove a car and turned off a nuclear reactor. We have Amazon drones coming on the scene. Uh, we have the uh, autonomous vehicle, which I think everyone is very familiar with, uh, the use cases involving that with Google and Tesla and so on. And this is where we are with robotics right now. So we're still kind of at the nascent point of where we want to go in robotics. But I think it's very important to always keep the future in mind. And one of the things that is on the horizon for robotics is something like the nanobots that uh, wade through blood to deliver drugs. Uh, we have the SLAM, uh, an ML an automated wheelchair. This was a collaborative project from Stanford and McGill. Uh, this is actually one of my uh, former classmates. Uh, we have Google Tango doing uh, SLAM in indoor spaces and museums using cell phones. And then we have things like underground um, navigation and things like space research where you really see SLAM start to become very important and vital in you know the next generation of robotics. So uh, a lot of people aren't, aren't familiar with SLAM so I'm going to go briefly over what SLAM is. So uh, SLAM is basically a, it's a probabilistic algorithm that takes a discrete set of steps and uses Bayesian inference in one of the main variants, I'm talking about the extended Kalman filter, to predict uh, the location and position of a robot while mapping. So the reason they call it simultaneous localization mapping is because the robot is simultaneously localizing itself in a given space, figuring out where it is in reference to the objects in that space while mapping that space at the same time. So this is just one of the variants of the equations that you would get, but SLAM has, um, I'm not going to say a million flavors, but many flavors. <laughs> so what are some of the key challenges in SLAM right now? So SLAM is still an unsolved problem. It's been in research area, I think, for at least 30 or 40 years. Uh, and it started off on embedded systems, which had like limited memory, limited resources, lim limited computational power. And that's one of the things that I hope to address by bringing SLAM into the IoT space. But we're still looking at computer vision issues. Uh, computer vision is still a hard problem. Figuring out what a robot is seeing based on camera images is not as easy as, uh, obviously, for humans. Uh, we still have the problem of moving objects in non-static environments. Basically, if you're an autonomous vehicle, we're talking about pedestrians, we're talking about other vehicles, we're talking about animals, uh, data association. And so this is uh, another problem that is uh, very uh, favorable to the machine learning space. Uh, basically, it's trying to figure out when, when you've seen something before as a robot. So as a human, that's a very simple task. We just look at it and say, yes, I've seen black chairs before. It's a common thing. But when a robot sees this, coming from different angles, coming from behind or in front, or what degree it was looking at, what reference the camera was pointed at, these are all things you have to take into consideration because you only have a series of points to determine what you're looking at. So, I mean, it's, it's still a very unsolved problem, I'll say. Loop closure is very similar to the data association problem. It's kind of trying to figure out when you come back to a point you've already been. It sounds simple, but if you're navigating a space and you're mapping that space, and this is a new map, you don't necessarily know where you are in reference to where you are, were before. So again, this is a very um, difficult challenge. Uh, one of the places you've probably already seen SLAM is with the Roomba uh, and the robot vacuums where they're mapping the indoor space in your home and then they're vacuuming all around and hopefully keeping it very clean. I don't actually own one, but I hear they're great. <laughs> so. And so as we come to the next part was why SLAM on IoT? So SLAM is one of the fundamental challenges of robotics. I mean. If we're going to explore space, if we're going to have the Mars rovers, we're going to need to make a map of Mars. We're going to need to know where that robot is on that planet. And as far as I know, they don't have GPS on Mars yet. 
Uh, and even when you're talking about using GPS, GPS is not 100% reliable. You have areas where there's weather phenomena, areas that are difficult to access by the satellites. Uh, you have buildings, you have moving objects. It's not the be all and end all of moving vehicle research. Uh, and then computationally, when you talk about the SLAM in the 3D space, it becomes computationally very difficult. You enter into a 3D point clouds where you're trying to map these structures. You don't have space on an embedded system to maintain a history of what you've seen before for very long. So you're constantly interfacing with other networks. With the autonomous vehicle, that's usually a GPS, and it's usually stored maps, such as in Google Maps. But if you've used Google Maps, you know that they're not 100% reliable, and especially in certain areas. So I've gotten lost a number of times with Google Maps. <laughs> um, so. The benefits of bringing it into the IoT space is that we get a seamless integration and we get uh, scaling that allows you to improve on the heuristics of the algorithm in SLAM uh, without losing any of the performance expectations of an embedded system. You get to uh, integrate it with things like smart cities, lawn mowing, dog walking, kitchen appliances. Uh, there, you know, there's a number of platforms that are there for integration. Uh, weather data is one of the main things that you want to look at for these types of integrations in IoT systems. And some of the current approaches is ROS. ROS is obviously one of the stand. I mean, if you're in, I'm sorry, if you're in robotics, ROS is one of the standards. It's a robotic operating system, and it's a great framework. It's open source. Uh, however, it comes with a lot of the baggage that associated with a lot of long-term open source development that is kind of not integrated into a wider space. For instance, like Spark, like if it was integrated into another platform. I think we have the opportunity to do a lot more with it. And it's also not truly a real-time OS. So it can emulate a real-time OS, but it's not truly that way. So I think um, the question becomes, when we look at all of these different semantics that go on in SLAM, and we look at where the autonomous vehicle is now, why would you even build an autonomous vehicle in isolation? And I think that's a question for Silicon Valley because they were kind of the main generators of this kind of model of building it in isolation. Definitely for military applications, you want something that can operate on its own uh, without interfacing with the network. But if you're talking about the consumer market, you want to look at um, integrating that with a much bigger space. And the reason I say this is I have two main examples. So the Google car has been on roads and it boasts about having gone millions and millions of miles across the country. Now, if you're on isolated highways like I-80 east-west across the U.S., that's, it's relatively easy. You're in the Midwest. There's nothing but like kind of tumbleweeds that kind of roll across the roads at those points. <laughs> so it's easy to avoid those. Um, another issue, I, I think, is they also had closed tracks. And then they released them in cities. And then they started having accidents. And then they started saying that the accidents weren't their fault. <laughs> so they were saying things like, uh, the car hit us from behind, and it was the other driver's fault. But as a human driver, I, can't have, I don't have that same benefit of the doubt. Like, no, it's definitely not my fault. I, I didn't stop suddenly, or there wasn't something that I was avoiding. It's always the other driver's fault for hitting me. Uh, their most recent accident occurred however, when a Google car tried to merge with uh, traffic and merge in front of a bus. The Google car assumed that the bus would allow it to merge <laughs> because that would be a logical thing, I guess. And, <laughs> and of course, the bus uh, and Google car collided and there was an accident and there were some injuries. Uh, luckily, no one was seriously harmed in, in this particular incident. Uh, Google's comeback from this was saying that they want their cars to think more like humans. However, I've been on the road with other humans uh, for a number of years now, and I can honestly say I do not want more of those kinds of drivers on the road. <laughs> uh, the other incident was with Tesla and their autopilot mode on their vehicles. So um, this was a little bit, a little bit more uh, unfortunate, I guess, because this has resulted in a fatality. So the Tesla autopilot was using uh, computer vision to determine when it was seeing, what it was seeing in front of it, and it wasn't integrated into a network. So it saw a semi-truck, which was a white, uh, a big white side of a semi-truck, and it saw clouds and a big bright white sky, and it couldn't distinguish the sky and the semi-truck, it couldn't differentiate them. And so the Tesla car drove uh, the driver into the truck and he was killed. So, I mean, this is really unfortunate, this, and it's really avoidable, I think is my main point, is if these cars hadn't been built in isolation, if they hadn't been built on these proprietary models of private distribution, then we could have had something much safer. And when I say much safer, I mean, there's a world of information in the IoT space that it could have integrated with. 
could have, for instance, had weather data. We could have had traffic and other vehicle data. If you have elephants walking the roads in your city, then we could have had that data. Um, and also pedestrian data. For instance, if you have a cell phone, that cell phone is usually connected to some sort of a cellular data cloud. We can connect that into the IoT space and you can detect when a person is in front of you and have an emergency stop. For instance, if the driver of that semi-truck that the Tesla vehicle hit had a cell phone, that would have been in the IoT space. The car would have known that there is some sort of moving or living object in front of me I should not engage. Or if the truck itself had sensors that were connected to the IoT cloud, then it could have said, okay, the trajectory of the truck is there. Regardless of what I'm seeing and, or calculating with computer vision, it's wrong because there's another sensor telling me that there is an object that is on the same trajectory. So these are safeguards that we can build into our systems if we integrate the autonomous vehicle into the IoT space. Uh, and then there's other things that are beneficial. For instance, if you have a strip of road that is particularly rainy or wet and you're a car driving along this road, we can calculate over a series of cars the amount of slippage, the, you know, the optimum speed that you need to get the best traction on that strip of road, and then we can determine what that speed is and we can relay it to you before you get there so that you have the best chance of being safe at that particular intersection. Uh, one of the, I guess, the more convenient aspects would be integrating it into the smart home. So we have a lot of smart fridges and iRobots and things happening, so let's say your smart fridge knows you're out of milk and it also knows based on your GPS data that you're near a grocery store that you usually frequent. The fridge can send you a message to the car, hey can you pick up milk, we're out. And you can do that and you can do it in a convenient way without having to go all the way home and find out you're out of milk and this is kind of the less crucial one but still nice, I mean I run out of things so it'd be great to know. So I guess the next point is how do we move into that space from where we are now? Uh, and so that's why little PQ is here. His name is Priyan Koram. So he represents the autonomous vehicle on the cloud uh, for this particular use case for us. I did ask for a car. I was denied. Uh, <laughs> I am going to reapply. So, <laughs> But uh, GPS, odometry, and visual data, these are some of the main sensors that you have on cars and vehicles in general. PQ has these same sensors. He streams the same data. And in the platform that I implemented on uh, Kafka and Spark Streaming. These are modeled using Kafka messages into the cloud. And in this case, we have a Spark cloud uh, running Spark ML, running Spark Streaming. Uh, and then you can get sensor corrections, you can get proximity data, you can get weather data. We recently acquired the weather company, so it's a little easier even to get that weather data. Uh, cell phone data and traffic data integrated into the same space. Uh, so this is kind of where we're going. And I don't think we should stop at that point either. So I, uh, ATVs are kind of the next point, but the final point is gonna be getting every sensor that we have in this entire IoT space into the cloud using one of these really flexible kind of models. And the open source model I think is ideal because you don't run into these proprietary issues. For instance, if you have a manufacturing plant where they're optimizing their plant on site and they have customized robotics in this plant and they're sending these sensor messages back and forth, you don't want to have to deal with, well, my sensor message is in this proprietary format and I do not want to share it with this other company who has it in their proprietary format. You can say, we have an open source format that is for everyone. You can integrate your sensors into this format and we can detect them and we can give you analytics that are real time and that are optimized for what you're doing. Uh, and th that's a number of cases. That's like connecting distributors and suppliers, timing your robots to make sure that when they run out of supply, they can automatically start up again when the supply comes, uh, optimizing power usage on the factory floor. I mean, there's a million different applications if you've ever looked into the IoT space. And I think we're just at the beginning of the possibilities of where we need to go. So, um, uh, more sensors, more problems, okay. <laughs> Uh, so I think in the next, uh, next three years, we're projected to have 30 billion uh, set with sensors available for the IoT space. And this is a prediction out of uh, IBM Watson. Uh, and then total, we're predicted to have 212 billion. And so I can predict probably, and this is just me guessing right now, that in the next 10 or 15 years, all of those will be available and connected to the IoT space. Uh, I think my estimate is pretty good, but if I'm wrong in 10 years, please correct me. Uh, so the next part is, the framework, so the actual implementation of how we get into this. So Kafka has its own partitioning scheme that it came out of, I think it was originally developed out of the LinkedIn labs. Uh, and then this partitioning scheme is great for what they were doing. They were getting messages from uh, HTML systems, from websites, and they wanted to get real-time analytics on the customer usage and interactions with their site. However, 
For our use cases where we we're going to bring into the IoT space, we need something that is designed to handle different types of latencies you expe experience from different sensors. For instance, a visual sensor on a robotic platform or on a vehicle is going to have a much lower latency, it's, or is going to expect a much lower latency than something like, uh, like I say, when you're out of gas, because that sensor is only going to happen probably every, I don't know, 150 miles or so, whereas the visual sensor is happening in milliseconds. So you need to account for that. Also, odometry, that's going to be at the millisecond level. That's not going to be at the second or minute level. You're going to want that happening all the time. However, you're going to have a brief span where your odometry stops when you stop, and that could be overnight or when you're at an event or something of this nature. Uh, and GPS data is also going to have the same similar latencies. So how do we handle these different latencies? How do we distribute these loads? So for me, I thought looking at this, this is a machine learning problem. This is something where we need to detect the sensor and we need to determine what the latency of that sensor is and where it belongs on the, distri on the distributed cluster within the cloud. And so this is one of the schema that I, I implemented for determining how to partition the Kafka partitions that are native in the Kafka, they're native in the Kafka package. Um, but then these are realigning their um, original partitioning schemes because their partitioning schemes are based on a slightly different uh, model. So this kind of looks at sensor latency and intervals and then distributes the sensors across the nodes according to that sort of model. And this is only one of the schema. So there's actually three or four different schema that you can uh, implement. Uh, I guess I filed a patent for, for these. So, but if you want to use them, you can just ask me. <laughs> it's fine. Um, and then you use these kinds of questions to figure out which node that sensor should be on and where it should be in the cloud. And this is just one point. This is the entry point for your analytics. And so this is part of developing a template to determine what the sensor is, how it's being used, and where it is, where it is in the world. And that's also, you can also co-locate co your clusters across different nodes in the cloud based on you know, the ge geography and the space. So, yeah. so the next point you enter into is, well, we need to do real-time analytics. We need to figure out where these sensors go. But once we have the sensor data, once we're deciding to work with it, what are we doing? So at that point, we're looking at uh, real-time learning. And so this is um, another schema that I implemented for Spark. And this is uh, in the Spark streaming space. So you have the Kafka messages coming into Spark streaming. And then you want to figure out what to do with those messages. So we looked at the Volpe Babbitt implementation in their Terraskull data learning paper, and we expanded upon that model. Uh, and this was just as an entry point for how we want to do real-time learning and how we want to, it to proceed. So basically, their model uh, emphasizes an out-of-core model for doing the analytics. And we look at building both out-of-core and in-core, because as you probably know, Spark is primarily in-core. You want things in memory, and you want them to happen very rapidly. But that doesn't mean you need to exclude the batch processing. That doesn't mean you want to throw away your history. And that doesn't mean you don't want the analytics that actually take a really long time to run. So what we did was we took both of those and kept them in play. We built in a cache that kept the global and local optima for both the batch and for the real-time processing. And then we have a model that is running. And the model automatically retrains based on the divergence points. And the divergence points can be set by the customer, the user, or whatever the framework requires. So you can say, well, you know, if you get so far across this, this certain threshold for what I would consider a good model, then you need to look at the local optima and, and your local and global Ottoman to tell me what's a better model that we need to implement for this particular schema. And you can also automate that process. I think a human needs to be in there at some point because if you get really far outliers, you can throw off your entire distribution. But uh, we're assuming that for the most of this, this is an automated process. Uh, and then you have your feature hashing, which I think uh, Nick Pentreath, uh, also out of IBM, has a feature hashing talk today, which uh, deals with that particular component. Uh, one of the other key things in the Volpe Babbitt model is their tree structure that aggregates uh, aggregates Optima up, up the tree. So this is a like a standard tree that you would like implement in like a binary tree kind of data structure. But each of these contains subsets of the data as it comes in. So this is micro batch data, and the micro batches are distributed across the nodes. Uh, you get local Optima for the models in those micro batches, and then they're pushed up and aggregated, and then given into the main model monitor and saved in the cache. So you can also do the implementation. I think in the original implementation in the paper, they actually use that as the ongoing model. But uh, I think that it's better as far as very, very large scale to have uh, an additional check on that feature. So those are kind of the, some of the theory behind the madness. Uh, so we looked at, in this particular implementation and use case, uh, the extended common filter. 
It's matrix space update est estimation. This is the nonlinear version of the Kalman filter. It's a pretty standard uh, model that's used in most uh, kind of uh, state estimation algorithms in robotics. I think it was in the original like Durant white paper uh, 20 or 30 years ago, so you can see that. I already introduced PQ, our little friend. Uh, this is an overview of what the framework or what the framework looks like for the common filter. So these are just kind of the steps that go on. This is from the wiki, so you can actually see what happens in one of the variants of updating the steps and the measurements and how this goes on. Now, in the traditional common filter approach, there is no history. So you're always looking at kind of Bayesian inference for each update, and you kind of throw away your past, except for maybe one step behind. Uh, what we can do when we bring it into the cloud is maintain that history. So we can say, actually, we have a better number for this update. So they use, I believe, Gaussian distributions to estimate the noise for each update parameter, but we can actually refine that distribution and not just use the de facto Gaussian. We can look at maybe there's another distribution that fits this a little bit better because we have the historic data to look at, and because we have it in a batch model on the side, we can extend that processing time. And so this is little PQ going to be doing slam. Uh, this is for the use case, this was the initial model that we used. We looked at an IBM soft layer cluster. We had the Spark engine, Spark MLib on the Hadoop stack uh, with Spark streaming and Kafka running. You can see it all, all the different nodes. And so, you know, this is kind of some of the, the underlying structure. But ultimately, the goal is we want a high-performing plug-and-play cloud for smart robotics, drones, intelligence systems, and ATVs that allows easy, tunable interactions for scientists and industry in any environment. So this is the overall flow of the data. So you have your simulated turtle bot or your ATV, whatever the case may be. You can think of him as a tiny car if you like. Uh, Apache Kafka, Spark Streaming, Spark All Analytics, and then we want that to go full circle. So what we do with PQ is we actually install Kafka on PQ, and that's all he's running is his sensors and his Kafka messages. And then we can uptake the Kafka messages and send back the updates for what we think is the best state estimation for PQ, and in the wider use case for the ATV. So you have improved performance uh, for your RDDs and Spark ML. Uh, I guess some, this is some of the example code uh, that we wrote for the Apache Kafka component. Uh, and then you have your Spark streaming integration with Apache Kafka. So Spark streaming does not use the standard Kafka consumer. It has a built-in consumer. So you have to work around that a little bit. It's a little bit tougher to get some of the metadata from the Kafka messages. Uh, but that can easily be uh, worked around and have some of that in the code. Uh, one of the main ML or machine learning cases is looking at Ransack. So Ransack is a very basic algorithm. It's like random sam sampling and consensus. Basically, you look at a line of points and you try to determine if a given point is inside or outside that line to make out if something is a wall or not a wall. Uh, and so this is one of the use cases that we looked at specifically for Spark ML. Uh, one of, I guess, the drawbacks was with Spark ML is matrix computation. So that can be distributed across many nodes and you need a very intensive kind of linear algebra library and that's one of the things we're looking at in the future for Spark. Um, but the fact that you can distribute those computations, the fact that you can optimize them, the fact that you can look at deeper matrix factorization, which still is an ongoing math problem that is very difficult, is a huge benefit over the traditional embedded system. So, yeah, so, so these are some of the challenges that I talked about earlier. Um, and then I guess we can get into some results. So this is a standard snapshot of how PQ sees the world. He runs an RGBD camera, which is an RGB depth camera. So this is just a standard color RGB image. You actually don't use this particular image unless you're doing point cloud navigations in 3D. Uh, I look at more depth images. So depth images kind of give you an idea of how far or how close something is. And along with the laser ping, it gives you an idea of what the distance is. So after a certain range, lasers will kind of fade out. Uh, and then you have an issue with glass. So he's looking at glass in this particular snapshot. And obviously, uh, well not obviously, but they can't see glass. They don't have a way of determining when there is glass. And there's a, several computer vision algorithms that are in play to kind of fix this issue, but it's an ongoing problem. 
So we look at landmark acquisition and CPU time, and we looked at this on a simulator to begin with. So we looked at the uh, Gazebo simulator, and I connected the Gazebo simulator to the Spark Cloud, and we also did the embedded version, and we looked at kind of the CPU time over 500 iterations. So the embedded actually failed to complete running its LAM algorithm at 500 iterations. It got up to around 300. Uh, and, the framework with the, and the framework actually had a much better exponential growth. It was much slower, and it actually completed it a little bit more rapidly than the embedded system. And these are the maps out of the, um, out of the gazebo simulator. So these are really nice maps because you're working with simulator data and all the noise is very pretty, glossy and noise distributed very nicely and you're not dealing with actual like real world semantics. And these are about, so the first one in the embedded framework took two minutes to generate that map. Uh, on the Spark Cloud, that was down to about 30 or 40 seconds. So I think that's nice. And this is simulator data, but you can see there's already a gain in the very initial implementations of the framework. So this is real data. Uh, so this is our, one of our offices at Spark STC. Uh, these are the kind of the histograms of the obstacles that it's detecting, and this is in a MATLAB graph. And then this is actually a graph of the laser scan. Notice the laser scan is a lot less pretty than the laser scan that we had in the simulator. Uh, also, you can see like where there are huge gaps. So you have a gap where you see like there's a row of seats. You have bumps in between seat legs and table legs, and then you have some things that look like spray out. So the spray out is you know, the laser, the range of the laser didn't go far enough to detect an obstacle there, so you have to be within a certain distance. I believe for this one, it's about 1.2 meters. If you're beyond that, then it looks like open space to the robot. So you need to have the real-time calculations happening rapidly, especially if you're going fast. He goes at about 0.6 meters per second at one of his maximum velocities. Um, but if you're going at car speed, you, this is going to happen, have to happen a lot more rapidly than that. So this is just a, you know, a general map. I believe this took like a couple minutes to generate at his very, very slow speeds. Uh, but you get an idea of where the problem still is and where we still are doing, working with the computation. Uh, so, so yeah, these are, again, uh, simulator data. Is that the public choice? Sorry about that. Oh, I'm going backwards. No wonder. So our next steps are automated message identification and partition manage with, with Kafka. We want to improve those algorithms. We want to improve that space and implementation. Uh, we want to do expanded stochastic analysis beyond gradient descent. So that's common filter and extended common, common filter. We want to improve our accuracy and precision. Those are always the goals, especially in ATVs where you want to be as accurate and precise as you can. Uh, path planning algorithms, once you've generated these maps, you want to be able to plan a path optimally between obstacles and things of that nature. If you're on a street, you can use GPS, but as we, all, as we said before, Google Maps aren't 100% reliable. Uh, we want to incorporate swarms and particles. So with ATVs and the IoT space, you're dealing with multi-agent robotics. So you're going to have more than ro one robot. It's not just PQ. It's going to be PQ and all his little friends. So you have to make sure you manage them effectively and that they don't collide with each other. Uh, and also that they don't cover ground that they've already covered. Um, and if you're dealing with cars, you want to make sure that you can distribute the cars on the roads in a fashion that is optimal for all the drivers. Uh, and then building a complete robotics library in Spark would be, I think, super fun and nice. And then I have a short demo. <laughs> uh, okay. And so this is PQ doing some navigation in the uh, Spark STC. Yes, there was music. Oh, I guess music's not allowed. So this is Spark STC, this is IBM, this is PQ on a table. So he has to not fall off of the table, and he has to navigate uh, down this path. You can see he's looking at the glass, he's not sure what that is. Uh, that's me, uh, he's uh, slightly programmed to detect me. I think if there was somebody who was also wearing scarves and things of that nature, he would follow that person too. Uh, and this is an illustration of some of the SLAM problems. So this is at our Watson Data Experience lab, uh, office in San Francisco. So this is him. He actually runs into the glass, right? Because he can't detect it. So he doesn't realize that the glass is an obstacle. And because of the way the windows are set up, you can kind of see that he's not the best at navigating this. But here he avoids these uh, weird little round things. It goes on for it. This is me recording him. So had some out of him. So he avoids me effectively. Now, 
This is him going back to where he started. So this is the loop closure data association problem. So he doesn't realize he's already been here. So we're not accounting for this yet in the algorithm. Uh, obviously, I just got PQ recently. But he doesn't know that, hey, I've already been here. I've already covered this space. I've already mapped it. So if you're running a map at the same time, he's going to remap that space. And you're going to get an inaccurate map because it's going to have this weird overlay where you get the disturbance and noise of this particular area. This one's a little dark. but. I thought it would be good so you can see like, what happens when navigating in the dark and in a nonlinear space. So this room is a, a kind of a star room, and he kind of navigates around it. And you can kind of see that happening and trying to avoid the obstacles. He has a little bit more trouble avoiding them in the dark than he would in a lighter situation. But again, he's running depth perception. Uh, and yeah, so I think that's a good example. And then I'm a moving object. I purposely jumped in front of him to frighten him. Uh, he was not frightened, but he did move. <laughs> and I think that's it for me. OK, we've got time for a couple of quick questions before break. Any questions for Jay? Well, the presentation was so fabulous, you're overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll believe that just because it's nice. <laughs> okay, we have one here. So, uh, what, what kind of a, a platform are you using? Like, uh, are you using like Linux uh, platform or a Windows or how? I'm, I'm personally working on a robot that is going to uh, go to my uh, on my lawn and uh, kill the weeds. <laughs> so uh, I start with Ross and all that, but uh, I'm kind of curious to see like what kind of platform you're using. Like, yeah, so we're running Spark on Ubuntu, so we're looking at the IBM soft layer clusters. So this is a Linux platform, and you can just install Kafka on both that platform. And then on this system, he also runs on a Linux, but we're not using any of the embedded processing. We're just using the Linux portion to send and receive messages from Kafka. So you can install it. You know, It's open source. It's very Linux friendly. <laughs> You can install it there and receive and send and receive messages pretty rapidly. Uh, the latency was well below the threshold of the sensors. So. Uh, so how, how do you send the uh, the video? That, like you're still using Kafka, or how how do you collect the video? The uh, you can send the video as vectors. So you can collect them as vector images, and you can say like each image is kind of a binary vector, and you can represent it as a, as a series of vectors, and then you can make it send more quickly. But yeah, you're right. When you're sending the raw video data, there you do experience more delay than you would uh, with obviously like simpler data like GPS or odometry data. So what we tend to do is look at vectorizing it. So breaking all of that data into vectors, uh, you can look at kind of you know depending on how how nicely you want the image processed, <laughs> you know, depending on how many bits you want to look at and how many layers in those bits you want to send. Uh, but yeah, you can vectorize them and send them over the stream. And it's relatively rapid. I think we were in the millisecond range, and we were below the, uh, I think, the 30 millisecond uh, reuptake for the sensors. Uh, but if you're in some place where you have like a spotty Wi-Fi or something like that, then. <laughs> OK, one more question, quick question. So the ideal is no processing or very limited processing on the device. So with an ATV, you're going to have to have some onboard embedded processing because it's a car. You, you want for like emergency stops or things that need to happen less than a fraction of a second of a time. Uh, yes, but for this, the ideal is almost all the processing is in the cloud. The only processing that PQ is doing is the processing to send those messages from his sensors and to receive them and then update himself. So I, you don't want, you want the majority of it happening in the cloud, and you want the majority of the decisions happening in the cloud, and you want to make sure the latency between those is as low as possible. Because if you're an ATV and you're driving and you're getting weather data and you're within less than a mile of some sort of obstacle or impedance, you want to be able to say, hey, this is how you adjust it, and this is how you adjust it in real time. Or if you're experiencing like, pedestrians crossing and your computer vision hasn't picked it up, you want the cloud to be able to tell you there are people in front of you based on the speed of their movement and the trajectory. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Jay. Please show your appreciation. Thank you.